I'm from Ireland. I grew up in the Lake District in Ireland, and here we are in the Lake District in Italy. I grew up with six brothers. We are one of seven sons. Our mother was a teacher, our father a musician, and we lived on a 50-acre farm. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story is because back then there was a certain way of life that I would like you to capture in your mind and hold on to it throughout this talk. We grew our own food. It was natural, homegrown. Wild fish ran through the river. We were good at catching them. We still are. Every animal had a name. The cows had names. They lived in the nature. They provided us with meat and milk. <coughs> Nutrition. How about lifestyle? The farmers were busy from early morning in the afternoon, and they worked physically until after sunset. I want to leave that with you, and I want to talk about health. And more specifically, chronic disease killers. Okay, the reality is, today, in Europe, over 86% of deaths are due to chronic disease. These people are living devastating lives, their loved ones suffering. It's a terrible situation. In fact, by the time I finish this talk, 12 people in Europe will have died because of chronic disease. Chronic disease deaths are premature, but yet we are living longer. The longevity line is going up. But how about the quality of life line? The quality of life line is not staying with the longevity line. What it means is that people spend maybe up to 20 years in poor health before they die prematurely. Oh yes, we're busy talking about terrorist attacks, aviation safety, the weather, the economic situation. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. It's time to talk about that. Okay, it is now time to introduce you to these chronic disease killers. Chronic disease killers that lie within each and every one of us. Let's no, make no mistake about it. So, number one, chronic disease killer, cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease claims 40% of lives in Europe. And by the way, these numbers are similar, maybe even worse, throughout the rest of our planet. Let's take number two, cancer. Cancer is a disease involving abnormal growth which invades and takes over the body. We all know about formidable cancer. In the European Commission, we have the European Cancer Information System, and we can tell you that this year, in Europe, there will be 3.9 million new cases of cancer. Over 1.9 million people will die. Let's take number three, diabetes. Diabetes is a group of metabolic disorders which involve high levels of sugar in the bloodstream over prolonged periods of time. Ladies and gentlemen, they are the three big killers, contributing to 86% of deaths. So what do we do? What do we do to diffuse these chronic disease time bombs that lie within us? Oh, hang on. Maybe some of them are preventable. Would you like to find out how preventable these diseases are? Let's go back then to number one. Cardiovascular disease. Evidence tells us that, wait for it, 90% of cardiovascular disease is preventable. 90, not 9, 90. Take cancer. Between 40 and 45% of cancers are preventable. And let's take diabetes. 80% of diabetes cases are preventable. Well, this is just fantastic news. It's amazing, it's fantastic. But if we look at the reality, what's happening today, if we look at health expenditure in Europe, it's about 10% of GDP. That doesn't mean millions, it doesn't mean billions, it means trillions of euros. But the reality is, of all that money we spend on health, less than 1% goes to prevention. So, 
We are not here to name, to blame, or to shame. It is what it is. We, have, as humanity, have created that situation. But I have more good news. If we talk about prevention, there are two main ways to prevent disease. Number one, and now I want to bring you back to that image of my six brothers and I back in Ireland. Number one, nutrition, what we eat every day. And number two is lifestyle. Let's talk a little bit about nutrition. Do you know how much sugar, salt and fat you have put through your system today? Have you eaten at least 400 grams of fruit and vegetables today? That's about five portions. How about your red meat consumption? In Europe, we're eating double the amount of red meat we should and half the amount of fish we should. How about your legumes, your fiber? Then lifestyle. Lifestyle. We all know it. Smoking is very bad. In the European Code Against Cancer, it's the number one killer. And the number two cause of cancer in the European Code Against Cancer is passive smoking. So if you don't smoke, do not accept to inhale other people's passive smoke. Alcohol, limit it. Limit it as much as you can. And the big one, physical activity. Remember the farmers years ago, from morning to night, what are we doing all day? We're doing this. And then we go home, and we do this, and then we go to bed. So basically, there are the main things. Now, 40 years or more have passed on. Today, I'm in the Lake District in Italy, and I love it here. I'm a GRC scientist. I'm a scientist working in public health on chronic disease for the European Commission's Joint Research Centre. Now, I need to tell you that the EU and the Commission does not have a legal mandate to impose legislation on the member states to help the situation. That is up to the member states, the countries of the European Union. But we do and we can do, and we do a lot of very good work on spearheading projects. Let me give just one or two examples, and then we'll go towards the end of the talk. In the Joint Research Center, we have mapped school food policies. The children are the future. When children learn good habits, and the school is a control setting, it's an excellent setting, they will keep those good habits. Just like if they learn bad habits, it'll be difficult to change. With those school food policies, we then got the member states together and they all exchanged you know, practices. What do you do? How can we fix this situation? How can we improve this situation? We have looked to see how to improve the uptake of fruit, vegetables, and water in schools. We have even looked at national dietary requirements, and I can give you some shocking statistics now. Let's do it. If you take plain rice, plain rice in its natural form should contain, or does contain, about 0.5 grams per 100 grams. That's a half a percentage. But if you look what's on the market, what are people buying and eating? Some of those products contain over 30 grams, it's added sugar, 30 grams per 100 grams. So that's like 60, 70 times more sugar. We looked at breakfast cereals. Breakfast cereals all over Europe, the various categories. It was a chart from 0 to 35 grams per 100 grams. It was red, especially for the children. The children's cereals are full of sugar. They're going to school having already exceeded maybe their daily dose. We've also looked at front of pack labeling. I asked you earlier, do you know how much sugar, salt, and fat you've eaten today? Well, to be honest, you would be a genius to be able to find that out, because it is very difficult. Front of pack labeling, when you buy something and you want to eat it or drink it, can you look at the back of it and read and understand what's there? We are looking to improve that situation. We are mapping all the front of pack labeling techniques, and we will spearhead a project to hopefully change that. If we cannot communicate this to the people, then the people won't make the change. Okay, there were some examples of what we do. We could go on, but I need to come towards the end of this speech. Now, this is not just, if you take a step on nutrition and lifestyle, it is not just about reducing your risk of chronic disease. There are two other fantastic advantages. Number one, think about it. If 86% of us are dying because of chronic disease, 
how many of us are already toxic? How, how do we feel? Do we feel good? If we take a step in this direction, we will feel better. We will think better. We will sleep better. We will move better. We will do everything better. Before, when you thought, this is a burden, this is a stress, that will suddenly become, it's a challenge. I will get over this. How well-being should not be underestimated. That is for you. This is really for all of us. And there's a second big advantage, our precious environment. Imagine if millions of people make this little move towards eating and their lifestyle, just making that change. Cycling, walking to work, leave the car. The air will become cleaner. Take the stairs, not the lift. You save energy. Energy, climate change, we know the story. These are a lot of factors that we can do. So there are so many advantages in looking at these figures and numbers and saying, I'm going to do something. And now we're almost at the end, and I am looking at you. Because I have one request, to please take away even one thing with you that maybe from tonight or tomorrow you will go for a walk after dinner before you go to bed, maybe look at your fruit and veg uptake, maybe drink more water. Please take that with you. You will feel better, your loved ones will really appreciate it, and maybe then we can turn the tide of chronic disease. <laughs>